Hey guys and gals, welcome to Jack's Low Carb Journey episode 23. I don't know how long I'm going to keep doing that. I'm going to get something like 50. It's going to be a bit monotonous. But anyway, uh, what are we going to talk about today? As promised, we were going to talk about the benefits of what I consider the most natural human exercise that there is, walking. And uh, when I said I was going to do this yesterday, I had a couple comments from people who are like, you know, I'm really looking forward to this because all of the fitness gurus in keto and other places say that walking is very limited in what it can do for you and that any uh, changes in body composition are incredibly limited and that, you know, whatever gain you do get from walking, you quickly adapt to walking and therefore you no longer continue to gain from it. And all of that's basically bullshit. It's it's total bullshit. It, depending on what you're measuring, if you're measuring whether or not you're gonna look like Arnold or something, and you build some big cannons or whatever, um, sure. I mean, you're not gonna walk your way to a bodybuilder body if that's what you're looking for. The the truth is though, most people aren't, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. First, let's go ahead and give us an update on where Jack is. Pretty much no change. I was two nineteen six yesterday. I'm about the same today. And so I seem to be on like a four or five day plateau in that two, 219, 220 range. And uh, I'm expecting tomorrow or the next day to have a pretty good drop again like I usually do. If I don't, I'll do some things to unstick myself. One will be I'll increase my walking. Um, that's probably one of the easiest things that you can do. Uh, so anyway, before I get into walking, I want to address something that keeps coming up. I keep getting people, and I guess some of you that are new here, you know, maybe wouldn't realize this. I've been a public figure for a long time and my main outlet is not YouTube. I kind of do series on YouTubes and then I go away and that's why I don't think I'll ever giant YouTube channel. I have like 40,000 subscribers or something like that. Uh, but you know, a th the, all the people that you see that have like a hundred thousand, half a million subscribers, they have themed YouTube channels. I run a podcast and I have about 200,000 people a day that listen to the podcast and so they pop up from time to time with big concerns about what's going on elsewhere uh, with little framing as to what's going on. So they might hear me talking about growing food or something like that on the podcast or, you know, being prepared or whatever, or liberty or current events. And then all of a sudden they find out I'm doing this keto thing and they've heard this keto thing is so bad. And what's funny is a lot of them, people eat McDonald's and they don't have any problem with it, but throw away the bun and all of a sudden you're going to die. I mean, that's the mentality they come from. But the latest one was somebody that was explaining to me, well, you, you can lose weight eating a lot of meat, but you're going to get cancer and heart disease. And you're going to die, and that's terrible. And you should listen to these three idiots that are like vegan pushers or whatever, and they really know their stuff, and I don't want you to get heart disease and die. So I sent out a challenge to that individual in a comment, and I'll send that challenge out on this video to anybody that can do it. Anybody that can do it. If you can show me a study that shows a strong correlation between the consumption of healthy animal and plant fats that we eat on keto, like grass-fed beef, pastured poultry, pastured pork, avocado, uh, coconut fat, uh, high-quality butter, organic and, and grass-fed based cheeses and stuff like that. If you show me that diet with a correlation at all to heart disease and or cancer, in absence of high carbohydrate intake, that's the key. You can't show me it. Well, we studied these people, and they eat lots of fat, and now they're fat, and now they have heart disease. If you're not eliminating what we eliminate on a keto diet, if you can show me that study with solid methodology, not some bullshit somebody made up or somebody data raked some shit out of some country's population, but some some place where it was actually tested, and the people in the sample group actually consumed the type of caloric restricted diet that we do on keto which i'll even give you under 50 carbs most of us are under 20 but under 50 carbs over a long term had an increase in heart disease or cancer i'll give you a hundred dollars and you'd think with all the programming all the bullshit and all the lies and how everybody knows this is true it'd be really easy okay it's a hundred bucks you should be able to find it in like five minutes and get a hundred. Who the hell makes a hundred dollars in five minutes? Not many people. Some people do. Not many people do. So if it's so easy, and if you're so sure you're right, don't go get me somebody's opinion. Don't go show me the seven country study that obviously would not qualify. Okay, you got to show me people ate a high fat diet from high quality fats. Okay, not soybean oil. 
and restricted calorie of uh, restricted carbohydrates and had an increased risk of cancer and heart disease. 100 bucks, go for it. Good fucking luck, just to be blunt. Okay, now, let's talk about our main subject today, the benefits of walking. Now, I'm going to address this thing about, you know, it doesn't change body composition or whatever a couple different ways. Number one, if you get on a true, high-quality, healthy ketogenic diet, and you're getting sufficient protein, most of your calories from fat, high restricted carbohydrates, your body composition is going to change. You don't have to do anything else, and you are going to go from fat to thin. It is going to happen. Everybody that actually sticks through it, gets through the initial problems, despite some plateaus along the way and some fluctuations, what their weight loss looks like over the long haul is this. And by the way, their triglycerides, their cholesterol levels, all that shit looks like this. It all gets better. Blood pressure, everything. Type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, like everybody that does this either improves or actually eliminates the condition they were dealing with. There are thousands of people that have done that. So the body composition thing is going to happen. If you go more toward the carnivore level of things and you're still young enough, your body's going to get more muscular. I mean, Ken Berry said on my podcast that people started, when he started doing keto, people started accusing him of hitting the gym and he wasn't lifting weights at all. He wasn't doing any workout. So the body composition, a lot of it will come from keto in of itself in a high uh, meat-based, high-quality food-based diet. The hormones themselves will change the body's composition. But if you want to look like Arnold or whatever, if you want to be all ripped and muscular and built, yeah, you're going to have to lift weights. If you want to get like, you know, a Hollywood level lean body, uh, unless you have like some kind of stellar genetics, you're going to have to do, you know, aerobic conditioning workouts along with weight training. Okay, fine. Do you know how many people really, really, really want that? A very small number of people. Most people don't give a shit. And the reality as we go into this today is to understand that a lot of the people that give advice on fitness and health, lifting weights, working out, etc., they don't live in the real world. And I'll admit in some, on some things, I don't live in the real world either. So I speak from experience. And what I mean by that is when I get up in the morning, um, I do what I feel like. I don't have anywhere to go. I run a lifestyle business that lets me live my life and monetize it, right? So when I get up in the morning, like, my first duty is to, you know, go out and dump the pools and fill it up for the ducks. And then I take the dog for a walk, and then I come in and I make coffee, and I sit down and have coffee for a half hour with my wife. Uh, I watch a little bit of news, then I go out let the ducks out, get the eggs, and I fart around out in my yard for an hour, Okay. And then I get to putting together content for the day and doing research for my show and all that other stuff, right? So my life compared to the person that has to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning when the alarm goes off, roll out of bed, get their kids off to school, and then go to work for nine hours and then commute home, I don't live in the real world either. I actually do live in the real world. You live in the artificial world, but I don't live in your world. So when I tell people like how to garden and all these things that I teach and how to be prepared and how to invest and... Uh, how to build a better life, I try to come from a standpoint of, let me try to make this work for you versus, hey, because I can do it, you can do it. Because I can do whatever the fuck I want today. If I decide I don't want to work today, I can turn this damn camera off right now. I can put up a post on my blog from my pocket and say, hey, I'm taking a day off, guys. And it will not affect my bottom line. I will be able to pay my bills and no one will fire me and I'm good. So, Understand that a lot of these gurus that are talking about, you have to hit the gym, man, for like an hour and 15 minutes every day, or you're not going to be like me, ah! like that. Okay, they don't fucking do anything except see to their image. That's all they do. And if you want to be like them, and again, unless you have some sort of God bless genetic traits, because some people are just chiseled people, that's what you have to do. They mean well, but they're wrong. For the majority of people, so the majority of people will never have the time that they do. They will never make their life about their physical image. They don't live on Instagram and fucking YouTube. They live in the world that in, it requires them to work 8 to 10 hours a day, raise their children, take care of their homes, be a good spouse, all that shit. 
right? If you have eight hours a day to dedicate to your YouTube channel and your Instagram and the way your body looks, right? And you, you're, I mean, to the point where you're writing off your gym membership and shit because that's what you do for a living. You don't live in the real world. You don't live in the world that other people live in, okay? And neither do I on some, see, I'm admitting that. So walking to me is the thing that is universal that everybody can do. So let me give you my 12 things that I think benefit from walk, that you get benefits from walking. Number one is just on caloric burn. You can easily walk three miles in one hour. Three miles an hour, that's a normal walking pace. If you do that, you'll burn 300 calories for a 180-pound man or about about, uh, 200 calories for a 120-pound woman. Over a five, like if you walk five days a week and you walk three miles a day, that's a lot of calories. That's 1,500 calories for a 180-pound guy. If you're a 200-pound guy, it's more. And that's just based on like you and me and everybody else in the line at the state fair, as uh, Dr. Stephen Lewis would say. That's an average. That's not for people who are on a ketogenic diet with their metabolism raised up. That's not for people that are excited about their life the way that we are once we do this for a couple months and we start to see the results and we have that metabolism racing. It's not for people that are, you know, consuming medium chain triglyceride oil with their coffee every morning that has a 5% bump in your metabolism by itself. So what is that person burning in three hours of walking? Let's even say it's 300 calories. And you say, well, an hour, you just talked about people not having time. Well, I'm going to give you ways to have time, but... You know, simple lifestyle changes like how far away you park your car when you go to the store or the office can start adding distance on a daily basis. It doesn't have to be done consecutively. It can be broken up throughout the day. Simply designing walking into your life is easy to do, and it has a good caloric burn rate. And you can you you can burn more doing aerobics, but you don't burn that much more. You can't exercise your way out of a bad diet. This is what we're doing in conjunction with a a diet that already changes the body composition. Okay, Number two, walking after eating will lower your blood sugar. This is actually proven in real studies where it's actually examined. They let people eat whatever they want. They test their blood sugar. Then they have them eat the same thing the next day. And they have them take a walk and they test their blood sugar. The blood sugar goes down. Guys, the entire reason this thing works is because of hormonal changes that reduce how much sugar stays in our blood and thereby reduces insulin resistance and allows leptin to come back and actually tell us we're full and all these other things. So anything we do that continues to improve our blood sugar profile is only going to make things better. Next, um, another thing studies have done, and this is really, really interesting, is walking alone is a lifestyle change. Just adding a significant amount of walking to your life has actually been shown to boost immune systems. Now, I'm not doing this just to not be fat anymore. I'm doing this to be healthy. And nothing makes you healthier than a, than a good immune system. And I'm talking a 40 to 50% increase based on the studies that you read. These are solid methodology, you know, with, with good methodology, methodology behind them studies of people having less incidence of cold and flu, for instance, through a year just by taking a walk. I think there's a lot to that. Some of it's simply, um, it's respiratory health, getting stuff moving into the lungs versus being sedentary. But it's a benefit of walking, so why wouldn't you? Um, It's also been shown to increase energy levels. Like I said, what happens with with keto is your energy goes up. It may not in the first couple weeks. It kind of sucks getting through the keto flu period. But once you become fat adapted, your energy goes up across the board. But we all get tired. We all get lethargic. I'm going to tell you what. When we were in the Army and you were in a class and that class was starting to wear out the class, you could tell like the instructor just wasn't that good and the class was just starting to... You know, you're talking about a period of time when all you do is exercise. You get very little sleep, whatever, as well because you're in training. What they would do is they'd call, call a recess of the class and we'd go march. Not long, half a mile. Just go march, come back in, everybody be awake. So with studies plus just anecdotal evidence, we know this works. So better energy levels are just great for your life in general. Um, next, it enhances mood. And I think that walking puts us in a good mood in a lot of ways. But one of the ways is it allows us to process our issues. It can be meditative we can learn something during a walk. We can experience beauty during a walk. And we can do 
all of those in a single walk if it's a long enough walk. So let's, let's talk about this. Number one is processing issues. One of the reasons you can't sleep at night is because your mind won't shut the fuck up and you get worried about all the issues in your life. Well, your subconscious is supposed to deal with that with dreaming. But for your subconscious to deal with that with dreaming, your conscious has to dream with it and uh, deal with it enough so that you can go to fuck to sleep, to be blunt, okay? When you're walking, you have peace and solitude. Like when people see somebody walking, they're like, I'll leave him alone. He's walking. Hey, you got to leave him alone. It's like taking a dump. They, people leave you alone, right? Uh, that's why everybody reads in the bathroom because you get left alone. And because of that, you can think about the issues you're dealing with in a day in a way that you can't do any other way. Like when you're sitting at your desk or you're watching TV or you're driving in your car or whatever. When you're walking, you're free to actually process that and you'll find that you get better sleep because of it. Uh, next is meditative. So I think it really makes sense when you're walking to not always be processing anything. And one of the, this is also help your sleep. What do you think counting sheep really is all about? People lay down to go to bed and then they think about all the problems in their lives, all the stress in their lives, and they think, I'm, I'm trying to think of nothing, but I can't. Well, you can't think of nothing, right? That, that's, that's like a pure meditative state. But even people that do it, they have ways that they get into it. And counting is one way. If we're counting our steps or counting our breath, and we're focused on that thing, and every time we start to drift away from it, we come back to it. So a t typical meditation might simply be focus on your breathing. In and out. In and out. In and out. Every time you catch yourself drifting, don't punish yourself. Just bring yourself back to counting your breaths or thinking of your breaths or focus on your breathing, whatever you want. When you're walking, you can count your breathing in and out and in your head one and in and out and in your head two. And when you get to 10, start over or count your steps to 10 and start over to 10 and start over. It's why praying the rosary works as a type of meditation, whether you believe in religion or not. This is the same effect. All right? Ten Hail Marys and one Our Father. It's a, it's a process of meditation. That's why it was developed. And we can do that when we're walking. And what that does is it teaches us to quiet our minds. And then we can get better sleep as well. So that's another uh, sleep issue. Um, learning something, though. Like walking is something that's really so natural that it's mindless. So we can put our headphones in and we can listen to a podcast or an audio book or a lecture. or So we can learn something or entertain ourselves with it. We can also experience beauty, whether that's taking a walk somewhere that's just beautiful and seeing birds and trees and flowers or putting on like, you know, Bach and listening to some, you know, or Mozart and listening to incredible music instead of like, it doesn't always have to be screaming, yelling music, guys. I mean, I like some rock music too. I'm telling you, right? I grew up in the 80s. We knew something about rock. But, uh, you know, sometimes just having that really beautiful music or uh, beautiful sounds, like if you're somewhere where you can't be in a beautiful place, you can't be in a forest or something like that, nature sounds type things or something. So you can experience beauty while you're doing these walking, and this also helps with the mind. So that's all just the cognitive benefits of walking, and they're huge. And I could probably do an hour on just cognitive benefits, but I'm going to keep going to get this done. Uh, the next is, we should be walking because we were designed as walkers. The reason keto works so well, and there's some differences, I guess, classically from what people call primal eating, paleo eating, etc., but in the end, they all kind of result in the same basic nutritional profile. High quality fats, protein, minimal carbohydrate. And that's the way humans evolved. And that's why it works, because we have a genetic predisposition to do well when we eat this way. Well, humans have a genetic predisposition to do well when we behave in any way that we evolved to behave. And we were, we were designed as walkers. We evolved as walkers. Um, it is the most natural exercise that the body can do. And it is not an exhaustive workout, but it is a total body workout. When you walk, you know, unless you walk like some kind of stiff with a, with a board up your ass, your arms swing, your hands move, your head turns, your neck gets used, your chest muscles are used, your leg muscles obviously do the majority of the work, but your core works. You know, don't walk like this, don't walk like this with all slumped over. Walk, stand up, walk erect the way that our, our forefathers walked because they had to pay attention. Even when they were having fun and bebopping along, you know, 
hey, there could be a lion or a tiger or something else that's going to eat you, so head up, eyes out, like I tell my grandson in the parking lot all the time. You walk like that, get the posture right, and you're working every muscle of your body, albeit a little bit, but it's happening, right? Uh, so it's the most natural exercise anybody can do, so we should be doing it. It's also the exercise anybody can do any time of the year, regardless of weather or on a budget. You know how you would tell somebody, it says, man, I'd love to do keto, but I can't afford to eat all grass-fed beef. I'm going to have to eat some factory beef and some factory chicken. You'd say, okay, well, do the best you can, and you're still better off. Because doing it is better than not doing it. So sure, might you be better off if you had a personal trainer or worked out in a gym for an hour and 15 minutes every day, or worked out for an hour and 15 in the morning and 30 minutes in the evening, and you, you were you know doing specifically designed exercises? Sure, but are you going to do that? And is the average person going to do that? No, but the average person can get off their ass and walk. And what I mean by anybody, anywhere, any time of year, under any weather conditions is just that. Let's say that you live somewhere like I do, where it is 114 gazillion degrees out there. And unlike me, you don't have your freedom in the morning to get up when it's barely light out and walk. That's what I do, right? So you go to work, you get a lunch hour, go to Home Depot, go to Lowe's, go to Super Target, go to Super Walmart, whatever. Eat your, eat your lunch. It won't take you long. You have it pre-prepared. Get the hell away from the bake break room and all the people eating the crap you can't eat. Go in that store and just walk laps. Try to find a couple stores around where you work so you're not the same store every day where they start to think you're casing the joint. But I bet you, like at a Super Target, when I just think of the size of a Super Target, I bet you one lap around the main aisles on the furthest outright rung of a Super Target, I bet you it's well over a quarter mile. So if it's raining, doesn't matter, you can walk. If it's uh, cold, doesn't matter, you can walk. If it's really hot, doesn't matter, you can walk. Especially if you're doing it during your lunch hour. Because if you do it during your lunch hour, you can't come back to work covered in sweat like if you ran off to the gym. Now you try to squeeze a shower in, get your hair right again, all that shit. Like, see, this is anybody can do it. Go eat your lunch and take a walk immediately after eating and start processing that food. Kick it off. If you're on two meals a day, it's perfect. You take a walk, you go back to work, you knock out the rest of your day, you're in a better mood, you go home, you eat dinner, you're done for the day, you feel great. And again, like you want motivation, find a super Walmart. Go take your walk at lunchtime at a supermarket and look a super Walmart and look at the health of the people that are shopping there. Don't buy your food there, man. I know there's some good keto halls at Walmart, but overall, don't buy your food there. But you want motivation. Look at the people in line. Especially, I hate to be cruel, but I'm like the first of the month when everybody gets their welfare checks and their food stamps. Go look at what people look like there and you will stay motivated to not be them. So that's anywhere, anytime, any season. And if you can walk outside, if you can walk in a nature reserve, if there's a walking trail where you work, anything that makes it nicer around a pond or something, yeah, do that. But the absence of that is no excuse. And so the other thing is like, so you watch things like, you know, Jillian Michaels and Biggest Loser and that other show, uh, Home Edition one where they focus on one person. The grueling, miserable workouts they put those people through. They're going to, sooner or later, one of those shows is going to have somebody like their heart's going to explode and die on it. There are people that they really shouldn't be pushing themselves that hard, but they can walk. And all they got to do is just keep walking. And then you will get stronger, faster, and able to do more work. So it works for everybody. Unless you can't walk, like you're in a wheelchair, and you can't get out of it, you can do this. Um, next, it reduces cravings for sweet foods. That's another thing that's actually been proven. That if you get people to walk, and then you let them have access to like a buffet that has a lot of sweets and stuff on it, they eat less of them. No one tells them, like, they've done this in, like, completely blind trials, and they just eat less of the sweet foods. And what they actually think is that it, it, they're still iffy on being able to prove this, but it actually reduces hunger overall. And that makes sense if you think about it, if you're in a fat-adapted state where your body can easily access body fat, and you have stored fat that's in excess of what you need, any movement or activity is going to stimulate the body to start mining that fat. And as long as we're not in a fat-depleted state, i.e. we're too lean, the brain is going to tell you know, leptin, hey, guy, keep it going here, man. We're good. We got enough coming on in. This, we got plenty of fat. Furnace is full. Just tell me what you need, but we don't need you know, to overdo things here. So that's, that's a huge thing as well. 
It also easily becomes the basis of a routine and becomes habitual. Most important thing with exercise is to make sure you get it all the time. There's no way, better way to make sure it happens all the time than to make something a habit where it actually you actually feel like you've lost something by not doing it, like it's, out, it's missing from your life. Right? So since it's so easy to do and it becomes habitual, it happens. And again, we can have the perfect being the enemy of the good. You should be working out in the gym. You should be doing this and 87 sets of this. And I want you to think, like, I'm back to natural human behavior for a second. It is a completely natural human behavior for a person to get up and walk several miles. That if you take away the car in modern society, any human being that had any meaningful existence probably walked four to eight miles a day. It is a normal human activity. Do you know it's not a normal human activity? And I'm not putting it down as a form of exercise. It is not normal for human beings to lay on their back, hold onto a steel bar, and push weight in excess of their own body weight up and down 10 times, set it down for no reason at all other than to do it, wait 60 seconds and do it again and do that five times, and then go into multiple other what we call sets of that activity. It's not bad, it's not wrong. But it is not the normal activity of a human being, which is why we have to make ourselves do it. Human beings did not live that way. Even people that did can, like built stuff and things and drug things. It's not something you do over and over again unless there's a gain to be had from it beyond your narcissism, right? So again, I'm not put, weightlifting is one of the greatest forms of exercise we've come up with, but it's not normal human behavior. Walking is normal human behavior, and that's why it easily becomes a routine and a habit. And that's why once it's in somebody's life, it continues to happen. And that's better than having an exercise that's, let's quote unquote, better for your goal, but doesn't happen as frequently. Next up, if you want to make it better as far as your load bearing capacity, uh, reduction in things like osteoporosis and joint pain, etc. It's actually really, is the dogs are going to go nuts here for a second. The vet's doing a house call for our big shepherd. Sorry about it, guys. It's just going to be the way that it is because um, I can't stop now. I want to finish this. Um, but a light load bearing will definitely increase the joint benefits and everything else, and you can slowly increase that. And even if you don't do load bearing, especially females, the effectiveness on you know, not let me shut the door since people are loud now. Unedited live and real here, guys. So, um, it will definitely help because impact and bearing the weight of the body is the number one way to prevent bones from breaking down. I think if you're on a ketogenic diet, you're not going to have problems with osteoporosis. You know, drinking more milk did not fix the problem, did it? The United States is one of the worst osteoporosis uh, rates in the world, and it has some of the highest dairy consumption in the world. So it, it, that's not, it's not a calcium issue. It's a structural issue, and walking really, really benefits that. Uh, next up, um, it leads to better sleep patterns. We kind of alluded to that already, but I think that if a person – that puts walking into their life is going to have better overall sleep patterns. And so much of our health is based on sleep. And if you're getting up four times a night, you know, and I mean really getting up like, damn, I can't go back to sleep, you're not having a good quality sleep pattern. And it's not good for your liver health. There's a, a certain time of night that it's called like the liver zone. And it's when your best liver health uh, rejuvenation happens. And you need to sleep through that period of time. Uh, and that's why a lot of times people that have like alcohol problems and drink a lot or have dietary problems and have, if you have like a really swollen belly all the time, like where it looks like you somebody poke it with a needle, it's going to pop. That's fluid. And a lot of that is due to liver issues. Like as soon as you start doing keto and all of a sudden your sleep gets better and your stomach goes down, that's why. And your, your liver is now trying to heal itself. So better sleep patterns, better overall health due to those is the reason for walking. Lastly, if you want strenuous activity, there is nothing other than you that prevents walking from being strenuous. There's so many ways to do it. I talked about a little bit of load bearing, you know, and that might be wearing a little bit of a weighted vest or a light day pack or something like that to add some weight to it. But you can easily add a significant amount of weight. And from my days in the Army, I can tell you when you're carrying a 40-pound pack, a three-mile walk is a lot different than it is without one. Then you can add hills. 
or you can increase your speed. All three of those are ways to make walking as strenuous as you want it to be. You can be on a dead flat surface with no load, but if you're walking at about five miles an hour versus walking at about three miles an hour, the intensity and the strenuous nature of it and the cardiovascular effect will go up. One of the reasons they say walking is not that great is people don't do it strenuously enough. Well, you know, I, you could go, I could go into a gym and curl two pound dumbbells. It's my choice to put enough weight on my arms to make it strenuous enough, right? I can go and I can actually do curls and I can use isometrics to build my muscles with no weight whatsoever. That's up to you. But you go to a place with lots of hills. We have a nature center for your lots of elevations. It's not I mean, around here, there's no mountains, right? But there's a lot of two, three hundred foot elevation changes. And so you're going up two, three hundred foot, and then you're coming down two, three hundred foot, and you're going up again and down again and up again and down again. And if you use a lot of elevation changes, like you're not a bicycle. Right, So if I'm on a bicycle, I work my ass to, off to get up a hill. Right, When I get to the top of that hill, I can coast back down it. And I can even get enough momentum to kind of come back up the next hill to a point where I have to start working my ass off again. When you're in really steep terrain, especially you're not on paved terrain or things like that, you're in a trail environment, when you're going downhill, you're not using as much energy, but you're using a lot more energy than walking on a flat. You're also working muscles that never work in any other configuration. Because you're resisting versus pushing. So when we're going up, we're pushing with our muscles, and we're resisting with them when we go down. We're working shins, those muscles in our shins a lot more. We're working all the little muscles in our feet. You know, if you ever talk to somebody that lost some of their toes, they'll have balance issues sometimes. Like, you lose a toe, it's not that big a deal. But they lose, like, their whole toe. And it seems like they shouldn't. They eventually develop ways around it. But that's because your feet are making all these little tiny adjustments that are completely unconscious to you when you're doing this type of walking. So the whole it's not strenuous argument is, well, how strenuous do you want it to be? But I'm going to tell you right now, if you'll commit to walking, let's say, two miles a day, which you can do you know, at three miles an hour, you can do that in about, what, two-thirds of an hour? Uh, which is like... What, 40 minutes-ish, somewhere in that range, right? 40 minutes? Yeah, sure. Um, your life will get better. Your health will get better. And it's not that hard. Anybody can do it. And if you turn it into a habit, it'll become a lifelong habit, and you'll always do it. And what I'd like to end with is if you read these stories about these places like in, in Asia or whatever, and they have these, you know, people average live to near 100 years of age, and they eat bitter melon or whatever it is that they say, you go and you look, and their diets are actually all significantly different. Now, none of them are super high in carbohydrates. Some of them are very plant-based. Some of them are very meat-based. Um, some have quite a bit of rice in them, but you know, there's a difference between eating a, a moderate carbohydrate load if you never get fat than if you're already fat. Okay, and the big thing that they all tend to have in common. There's a sense of purpose in the lives of the individuals. There's usually some sort of spiritual or religious component to it, and that usually involves a daily walk. A lot of times you'll find these things, and there's a temple up on a hill, and they'll tell you about this old lady that's 98 years old, and she's, so, she's in such great shape, she climbs up to that temple every day and pays her respects or whatever, or makes her sacrifice her prayers, and goes back to her house, and then plays in her garden or whatever, and down bounces her great-great-grandkids on her knee or whatever she does. And they'll say, wow, because she's so healthy, she can climb that hill. Maybe she's so healthy because for every day, for 90 years, she climbed the hill. So take a walk. With that, remember, cause of and solution all your problems is in your bathroom, right there in that mirror. You look in there and have a chat with that guy or gal about it. And your friend or enemy on the ground, that's the scale. I'm trying to turn it into your friend. I want you to do that for a better life. With that, I'll catch you guys tomorrow.